following program contains disturbing materials that may not be suitable for some resellers. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is John with Flippin' Ain't Easy. Now first, before I get started, I just want to put it out there that there's nothing but love here in this video. Uh, I absolutely respect and consider Kevin Commonwealth Picker my friend. And I want that to be clear for any one of you guys get into the comments because uh, I think sometimes things can be taken the wrong way, and I certainly don't want something like this to be taken the wrong way. Now, if you guys watched the video we put out a couple days ago, I think it was uh, back on Friday or Saturday, uh, he put a video uh, about, um, and this kind of is a video spurned from the content that I put out early in the week about the race to the bottom. And the video that I put out, put up somewhere above my head here, was talking about does the race to the bottom on eBay exist? And I think we've taken a common term from Amazon and sort of flipped it to eBay to prove a point. And I think we've, we've sort of used it in the wrong light. And of course, if you guys want to know my thoughts on the race to the bottom, go check out that video. But his was more in a reaction to some of the things that I said and either on that video or on my live stream talking about it more in depth and what he had said was that he doesn't really consider the price of his item what he pays for it uh, in the equation of what he sells it for uh, and he's more in uh, from what I gathered in his uh, video was that he's more trying to put it in tune with what the, the market uh, sells that item for or Maybe what the recent solds or the historical solds, maybe uh, he didn't say this, but maybe through Terapeak or the 90 day solds, but he sets a price and uh, he pretty much will sit on it. Like the uh, video that he did put out, uh, he did have an example. And, and one thing I want to do is want to do something a little different than I normally do. Um, I want to sort of you to hear what he has to say. So I'm not putting words in his mouth and uh you know hear what he has to say and then kind of respond to it the main question though and we're going to kind of branch off of that is looking at pricing pricing structures pricing strategies for resellers business models whether it's something as simple as you know what we always talk about you know the slow the fast nickel versus the slow dime and some other factors that i think are becoming increasingly important because what got me going on this a while back was my buddy john flipping ain't easy said something on his podcast and I thought, hmm, I don't really think about it that way. And listen, John is an amazing reseller with all kinds of amazing information. But it just shows you that people think about things differently. And I've since changed my opinion slightly on it, but I still think the same way. This right here is a great example of what I'm talking about. So this is a vintage, look at this, made in Hong Kong, size large Adidas Olympic Games. Now it says 1908, but it's just, I think it's like a... This is the London Games, and it is like the anniversary of it, right? 1948, 1908, and then whatever the next one was. So it's it's like a remembrance, but it's this cool jacket, Olympic jacket. And it sold, it sold on Mercari. Shout out this perfectly, Co Commonwealth. And it sold for $113 plus shipping over there. No fees on that one. So that's really cool. And I paid $10 sense for it so john said in that pot i think it was his podcast that they have it might be it might have been his show his live show but at any rate he said something and i it did one of those little head tilters you know like scratch my head like hmm i guess i didn't think about it like that or i don't think like that he said something like somebody sends him an offer and he went to check because he put i think he puts it in his in his uh, listing or something i can't remember what you said to be honest with you but it doesn't really matter at this point where he went to see what his cost was on that item to determine whether or not he would take that sale or not, that offer or not. And I thought, hmm, i never do that. Matter of fact, I, I pretty much have an idea of what I paid for everything, at least close to it, right? But he was actually saying that that part was going was gonna to be part of the determining factor in whether or not he takes an offer or not. And that's just not the way I think of it. But... I think when I've tried to explore this a little bit further, different people are in different situations, and I can certainly see that 
as a determining factor, I suppose. But I think it's not the way that I would go about it. Now, for me, the inverse, and I think John would actually agree with this, the inverse of this is 100% true. So the inverse is, instead of determining whether or not you're going to sell something based on what you bought it for, sell something at a certain price based on what you bought it for, that determination for me, of course, what something is selling for is going to really heavily influence, completely influence what I'm buying it for. Just for context, and by the way, John, come on over and, and chat over here if I mess up anything. You know me, that's not my intent. This has been hanging around for context-wise. It's been listed for probably 20 months. That's how long this thing's been listed. And I just now took that sale. Now in his example, he, he pulls off this really, really nice jacket from the Olympics, right? And one part I didn't play, his closet is packed and packed with other probably really cool things. I don't know if he can handle, um, another 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 similar items in that space, right? It's kind of a situation that I'm dealing with that I'm going to talk to you about here later in the video. So he goes on to say, he sold the jacket for like 130 bucks. I mean, we just saw the clip and I already forgot the exact uh, amount. He paid a dime for it. Now, remember that he knows he paid a dime for it and he paid a dime and got $130 ish for that jacket. Now he sat on that for over a year and got his price, which is awesome. Awesome. And I think one thing that you want to consider though, is if you place, let's say one of my toilet seats on that wall, instead of that jacket here, uh, one of the toilet seats, I'll stand, I've got a stack of them right behind me. Okay. Uh, I've got literally stacks upon stacks. I can't even get the camera to, to, to show it to you, but stacks upon stacks of these stupid toilet seats I just picked up today. Now let's put that toilet, let's put one of these toilet seats on that wall on the video we just saw. Now, if I told you I sold that toilet seat for $130 and I had it for over a year, I think a lot of you guys would have been like, are you insane? Um, you've got a stack of these things. If you're going to wait and hold off for your price and hold out for your price for months upon months, well, that's not the way to, to churn inventory. That's really not the way. Now, you got a lot of these toilet seats. Kevin had one of those jackets. And my contention is Kevin will probably never see that same jacket again. Probably not ever. So those are two different kinds of items. So in my particular situation, I've got 60 some odd of these toilet seats. He's got one of those jackets. If I had a, the type of space that he has to work with and B something like that, where I'm never going to see one like that again, then I think it would be foolish to take a, you know, even have offers set for that. You know, you, you name your price, you put it up there. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you guys have one-off items where you can't even put a, a comp to it. You have to kind of make your own price. And maybe you lower it a little bit here and there, but I, you're not certainly not taking uh, a huge discount on the item like I do with my toilet seats. Now, I may put this thing up for 60 bucks, this toilet seat for 60 bucks plus shipping, but because I have so many, someone comes at me with 30 and I'm into it for six, which is my buy cost on these. Um, I'm going to sell it because I'm going to make 4x my, my money after eBay gets their hands on it. And I'm happy. I get to move this. And so it's totally two different mindsets. Now, just to kind of add to what I do, because uh, I put the, the price that I pay for these in my SKU. So it's very, very quickly accessible when someone makes an offer on an item. I can go right into the listing and say, ah, I'm into this for six bucks. Now, in my mind, I'm painting. Sometimes I'll, I'll do this when I see an offer comes through. I know what I'm into the item for. And in my mind, I'm already putting a number out there. So I'm putting like 
40 bucks. Okay, I'll take it if it's 40 bucks. And then it comes across as 35. Now I've got a decision to make. Uh, how many do I have? How long have I been sitting on it for? Um, am I going to be getting more of these? So I get toilet seats all the time. You guys hear about it all on the channel. Is Kevin going to get another one of those jackets? Like I said, he'll probably never see another one of those in his lifetime. Maybe similar ones, but not that one. The, the large size from the London Olympics. Probably not. And that's the difference. And that's what I've been trying to say for the longest time. Is that there's different situations that will lead to very similar resellers. I think that Kevin and I agree on a lot of things. If I had that jacket, I wouldn't be taking a quick offer. I would be waiting for a, maybe I'd have a range in my mind. So I'm thinking maybe 100 to 150. Maybe I'll set it at 150. Maybe I'll put offers on it. But I'm saying to myself, look, you're into it for 10 cents. Who cares, right? But this is so rare in my mind that the least I can take is 100 bucks. Now, would I have sat on it that long? It just depends, and I'll tell you what it depends on. It depends on your space and your uh, the room that you have to work with. Let me show you what I'm up against here. Look at this, not only the type of item that I'm selling, I don't have a lot of space, guys. I mean, this goes back here. Uh, I'm in the middle of kind of doing a rearrange. You guys know the infamous uh, rack uh, seven and nine. They were in there somewhere until the racks gave way. I have limited very limited space i have a store of 200 items i could maybe go to 250 or 300 of these type of items and then i'm going to be out of operational space there are different price structures that upset the other side sometimes so for the folks out there who are trying to get top dollar maybe they don't have a lot to source maybe they're not I don't know, maybe they don't need the money. This is a big part of the equation, right? There is an opportunity cost for having your capital tied up in items. And that may very well determine how low you will go to sell an item quickly. And, you know, obviously if your cost is low, you're able to do that and you're able to churn and burn quite quickly and you can get that money back as capital that can be reinvested in another product. And so there's definitely an argument for that. And then there's some folks out there who buy and they want to get absolute top dollar. I actually think both models are right, but they're right for completely different people. And I also think that the strategy depends on the item. If it is a multi-quantity popular item out there that everybody has versus something that isn't, I think that is a determining factor as well. But price rarely plays into it for me, but it can for some folks. So I think that clip right there kind of explains what I was trying to say, that that's a one-of-a-kind item. And he did place it at around 200 bucks, and eventually over time, he was able to, to move it. it. took a while, but he moved it, right? But he's not taking a $20 offer on it. He paid 10 cents. That's a 200x flip, right? But that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say, you know, if you can get 10x flip, then no matter what, then jump on it. The 10 cents, now, who in the right mind would sell that for 10 cents? That's nuts, right? I'm not trying to say that, hey, uh, we're playing this math game of eBay, and if you can get 10x or more, no matter what, then take it. No, I'm saying to evaluate your situation. Use common sense. If... Regardless if you paid for it, let's say you were given, someone gave it to you for free, then in theory, you could sell it for a dollar and say, you know, you've made infinite amount of profit. What I'm saying is that the buy cost has, you have to place some importance on knowing the buy cost so that you don't make a mistake in going too low on a common item. Now, on a collectible item, you know, like this particular jacket, you're going to have a, a, a uh, maybe a price, a threshold. This is the lowest I'll go. You can continually lower the price over time until you finally find that unicorn buyer that's going to give you your price. So get to the point, John. What are you talking about? I'm just trying to prove the point that no two resellers are alike. We may think alike. Many of us may have the same philosophies and ideas, but not two of us, no two of us source the same. Uh, 
or maybe our financial situations are all different. Maybe you need the fast churn because you need the money. You have no other way of getting money into new product unless you're selling the stuff that's sitting on your shelf. I promise you that's not, not, not what's happening here. Uh, it's simply a philosophy that I believe where if I can sell an item for $20 that normally sells for 30 and that person selling that item for 30 is sitting on that item for weeks on end, but I can sell that for 20 within days, then I can flip that by two more, two 10 more $2 items. And by the time that person sells that $30 item, I've sold a handful more $20 items on that initial $2 investment. It's just that churn. Uh, there's no other word I can use to explain it. That's what I call it. That's what I do. And it's sort of making more sales within a short period of time that keeps compounding. And then when you're looking at your 30 day numbers, you're like, wow, um, you made a lot of money. And that's exactly what I'm doing. How can else can you explain a 200 item store that makes uh, $14,000 in a 30 day period? Come on. I mean, I've never done that prior to uh, this last year and a half. And yes, it has a lot to do with what I'm buying, but it has to do a lot with how I'm selling it and my mindset involved in that. Am I going to have the same mindset as Kevin in his jacket with a lot of the things? You see this stack of more toilet seats, guys, more toilet seats in my, my studio. Am I going to have the same mindset with these toilet seats that Kevin does with his jacket? No. Um, is Kevin wrong? No. I think we're both right for what we do and how we're selling it. And I think it is a mistake if you don't consider how much you're into an item for. And I know Kevin considers that because he talks about when he shows all the little things that he sells, he does talk about what he paid for it, right? So it's good to know that. It's good to have a reference. It also helps reinforce to you that you made a good sale or maybe you didn't make such a great sale. These are things that you have to consider because if your buy cost is too close to what you're selling it for, maybe you don't buy that again. And that's my only real reason for considering it because I know I have so much room that it's like, do I have a thousand of these sitting behind me or do I have one of a kind? That should, that's my point. What type of items are you selling? And that should influence your mindset. If you're selling the jacket that Kevin has, and you're so eager to sell it that you take, you'll take any $20, $30 offer on that because you're only into it for 10 cents. Well, I think that is the wrong mindset. Okay. And the flip side of that is if you're sitting on these toilet seats, but you've seen them sell for 60, you ain't taking a cent less than that because you've seen it sold for 60 and you'll sit on these toilet seats until toilet seats go out of style. Then that is also the wrong mindset. And you have to find where you fit in that equation. I mean, whether you're closer to what Kevin does or what I'm dealing with, it's all situational because I may come across a very similar type of jacket uh, next month at a yard sale. And guess what? It ain't going on sale the way these toilet seats are. And to me, I really think that uh, there is a right way to handle certain type of merchandise and there is a wrong way to handle certain kind of merchandise. And you cannot allow yourself to be so unflexible uh, where you are not willing to take offers on multi-quantity and so desperate where you're going to take anything, any kind of offers on, say, that Olympic jacket. So uh, hopefully you guys understand where I'm coming from, Kevin. Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. And, uh, you know, nothing but love and respect going your way, Kevin. Uh, hopefully you didn't take this video the wrong way because it certainly was not meant that way. So if you enjoyed the content out there, do me one favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. I certainly would appreciate that. And, and you know, while you're at it, hit that notification bell so that when I go live or come up with just another video out of the blue, you're going to be one of the first to know. So figuring out the sea of items that we have to sell on the eBay platform, what strategy to use for each type of item? Well, that's yet another example of how flipping ain't easy. And I want you guys to have an excellent start to your week, and we will talk to you very soon. Take care, everyone.